So if you have any objections, uh, let us know. Uh, and that being said, uh, let me actually turn to the first speaker of today, uh, Yukako Oshida. Uh, she is manager of the Global Coordination Division at GP CERT in Japan. And Yukako, could you tell us a little bit more about the cybersecurity threats? So which ones do you consider the most urgent at the moment? And what role could younger people play in mitigating these threats in Japan, but also beyond? Uh, Yukako, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much, Laura, and everyone in this, uh, in this event. Um, my name is Yukako Uchida. I work for the Global Coordination Division of the JP CERT Coordination Center, um, which is a national, one of the national CERT in Japan, um, based in Tokyo. So um, I'm happy to be part of this um, event today um, to share with you our um, perspective on cybersecurity um, from the CERT uh, standpoint and um, discuss with you some of the um, problems that we were facing. So um, when it comes to the threat landscape and especially um, given the situation that we were dealing with the, with the COVID-19, um, one of the things that we're seeing uh, increasingly during the last couple of months is that uh, um, we're seeing a lot of, uh, for example, um, phishing sites or like fake websites um, that are uh, related to COVID-19. So um, COVID-19 is actually used as an um, attractive theme uh, for, uh, to, to uh, trick users and recipients. So for example, uh, in, in the case that, that were observed in Japan, um, there are some uh, a lot of fake emails being sent um, that explains, um, for example, um, the websites where, where you can uh, buy uh, face mask. Um, in Japan, we 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 were in a um, very uh, strict um, shortage of uh, face mask um, couple last couple months. So um, that kind of theme was used as one of the um, trigger. And um, also there was some phishing emails as well uh, regarding the cash handout campaign by the government. So these kind of things are actually um, being used um, as to, to trick um, the recipients, um, not only the uh, IT technical personnel, but the general uh, population um, in Japan. And those emails um, are written in a very fluent Japanese language as well. So. Um, it was quite easy for um, general users um, to, um, you know, uh, to be deceived by those um, emails. And another thing that we would like to highlight also is the uh, um, situation where we are kind of forced to work from home. Um, so, for for example, right now I'm dialing in this in, in this event from my living room, and. Um, my, my organization actually um, advised many, many of the staff to work from home. So uh, I haven't been to office for quite a long time. So um, that actually requires um, working from home environment. And I know that uh, this also applied to university students, high school students um, requiring to use a, for example, um, like Zoom or other um, online platform. And uh, for example, uh, for employees, uh, like office workers like me, uh, we also have to use the um, work from home equipment such as uh, the virtual, uh, the VPN system uh, to log into our, our computer, which is located remotely in our office. So that kind of system used for, for uh, remote access uh, was actually uh, one of the targets um, for cyber attacks. So we see a lot of cases where those um, work from home systems um, being used um, and then um, attackers actually um, intruded into networks and like, for example, uh, trying to uh, harvest some information uh, from company system, things like that. So that's one of the uh, features that we saw during the last couple of months. So um, I think you, many of you may actually see a lot of um, scary things like uh, when it comes to cyber attacks, like nation to nation problem, like nation state, state actor, um, you know, cyber attacks, things like that. But it's not, not, not only those kind of, you know, um, nation to nation problem, but uh, as I explained, as in the um, COVID-19 fake emails and fake websites, 
um, some of the some other uh, kind of uh, cyber attacks also um, trying to uh, leverage um, those themes and target uh, general users. Um, you know, um, not not only the IT technical personnel, but the, including younger generations like students and moms, moms and dads at home. So that's one of the things. And uh, what we are doing as a CSERT perspective, um, so um, as I mentioned, I work in a global coordination division. So uh, my day job is to strengthen the relationship with, with other CERTs in different countries. Um, uh, many of the countries in, in, in the world at this moment have their national CERTs. So in order to solve incidents um, that requires international cooperation, um, we will be the point of contact to um, deal with those incidents. So um, my role is to um, kind of smoothen that kind of international uh, cooperation process. And um, so as I said, um, that, that, is, that is one of the work that CSER does, but the CSER actually uh, focuses on um, I think when it comes to uh, information sharing from the CSERTs, it uh, kind of um, usually targets IT technical personnel, for example, in the company or um, for example, at the university, et cetera. Um, so um, we're trying to share information as, as much as we can. We use different platforms. Uh, for example, we have a blog uh, channel uh, as well. We, we do um, information sharing in both in, in Japanese and English. So uh, we have quite regular information sharing as well. And, but uh, some other organization in Japan also uh, work on the uh, awareness raising activity in cybersecurity, um, especially targeting students and the younger generations as well. One of the initiatives that I liked from the past, uh, past years is that um, um, password security. So um, I think many of you use uh, SNS and the email service and different web services that are available on the internet. And then that requires you to set up different passwords and sets of credentials, right? And um, one of the issues is that uh, many, many of them tend to, um, you know, use the same password for different services or like just to, just for the ease of um, use, um, just use really um, easy passwords. So um, there was a campaign in Japan to um, raise awareness on password security. And then they use actually uh, some, some sort of uh, manga um, characters um, to, to, to be able to uh, familiar, for familiarize itself for a younger generation. This manga was actually translated to, into very uh, different languages, especially for uh, Asia Pacific region. Um, you can actually find that somewhere on, on our government website. So um, you can find that. And other um, initiatives um, that I'd like to introduce is that, for example, um, when it comes to information sharing from the CERT perspective, um, I'd like to mention that um, uh, CERT New Zealand is doing a great job uh, in uh, sharing information. So they have two ways of information sharing. One is targeting uh, for IT, IT technical personnel, um, which contains quite um, jargons, uh, technical jargons and ter terminologies, which are um, available for IT, IT technical per personnel. But they also have, um, you know, um, they also have uh, advisories targeting general users as well. So they are written in quite um, easy languages. So general users can actually uh, read and understand uh, easily. So that's that's one thing um, I'd like to mention. And you can you you can also visit the website if you're interested. And uh, one last thing I would like to mention in in, in the case of Japan is that. Um, that some industry group of the security vendors, they actually invented a card game, like a board games for uh, cybersecurity. Um, so that's something, um, one of the way for uh, awareness raising and also familiarize um, people um, with themselves about the cybersecurity technology and uh, how they can deal with the, um, the issue. That's all my point, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Yukago, for laying out the uh, cybersecurity landscape, what certs are doing, but also with solutions such as this board game. Um, and it actually brings me to our second speaker today, uh, Alex Blau. 
uh, Alex is vice president of Ideas42 in the United States, and he approaches cybersecurity from a slightly different angle, from a behavioral science approach. So I wanted to ask you, Alex, uh, what lessons can we draw when we look at cybersecurity from this behavioral science uh, perspective? And can we see that there are differences in the behavior between younger generations and older generations in this regard? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Laura, and thank you for the Cyber Forum for inviting me to speak today. I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to share a presentation with you all that we can run through real quick to hopefully cover a fair amount of um, our insights that we've been able to develop over the past few years. Um, can you let me know if you can see the full screen? We get a yes? Awesome. Is it changing? Yeah, it works well. Cool. All right. Wonderful. Um, and yeah, in the context of COVID-19, I can only assume that we've been pretty bored sitting around our houses uh, and probably doing some pretty bad stuff online. So uh, I hope that this can help us to think a little bit more about behaviors that we're taking on on our own and what we can potentially do in the future to design around these problems. So what can we learn from behavioral science and how can we think about differences between different populations in terms of age? So as a behavioral scientist, often what I see in the world is a lot of people asking this kind of question when they see people doing weird stuff, either online or in real life. Why did you do that? And you probably ask yourself that question of a lot of people around you. But as a behavioral scientist, I think this is probably the wrong question to ask. Uh, a lot of what we begin to understand through our research is to look around that individual to try to understand what might be going on in their specific context. You know, whether or not they have specific identities that they take on, uh, whether or not the specific environment that they're living in has something to do with the decisions or actions that they're taking, maybe what they ate in the morning or what they shouldn't have eaten, um, maybe under conditions of poverty, uh, or, or potentially even things they learned on the news that might impact how they think about the likelihood of events in the future, or potentially even cultural differences that we see across different countries. So the question that I often ask is, what about the context is actually causing people to do what we see them do and what can we think about redesigning within that context to get people to exhibit the behaviors that we ultimately want them to exhibit so i'm going to run through a couple of examples of things that i think are actually relatively big areas in cybersecurity and cybersecurity awareness that we've had a, a pretty difficult time solving for i think these are things that come up at conferences over and over and over again and yet we still seem to have very few answers about how to get around them um, so i just want to set a frame for for a moment a computer in and of itself is very much a context, as much as the world that you live in, the room that you're working in right now, and it presents to us features that might affect how we decide, how we act. And one of the things that I also want us to think very clearly about is that computers are built specifically to make it very easy for us to act quickly, right? If we look at the history of computer development, we know that we've gone from very slow processors and giant uh, macro frames to things that we can fit onto our, our personal computer today that runs significantly faster. But this context is quite difficult for human beings because you know, we sort of operate in these two different types of systems. One is a thinking fast, a system one, and one is a thinking slow or deliberately system two. Uh, when we think in our system two, we're able to weigh the pros and cons, the benefits and costs of various decisions. We're able to think deliberately about our actions and hopefully decide better. But the reality is that we can't always think slowly. If we thought slowly as we're crossing the street, uh, it makes it very hard for us to get across, right? We won't actually do it. But we can use our system one to recognize times that we need to avoid cars or be able to just walk on, on, a, normal, on a normal pathway. But that system one approach that puts us into this mode of automaticity often puts us in a position where we exhibit more biases as opposed to fewer biases. And so when we're thinking about this online context, this computer context, we have to recognize that the speed of our ability to interact with that system can have potentially deleterious effects on the outcomes that we're trying to achieve in terms of cybersecurity. So again, I'm gonna go through a couple of examples of what that might look like, um, and hopefully we can highlight a few common themes that we see across the spectrum. So phishing, as we know, is a huge problem. It's been a problem literally forever, uh, as long as email and other sorts of uh, ways of trapping people into you know, clicking on bad links or otherwise have been around. Understanding how it is that people end up doing this and going through this process and becoming susceptible is relatively critical, both to designing interfaces to make sure that we avoid them, but also to informing awareness programs so that we can tell people better information about how to keep themselves safe. So I'll give you an example. Imagine you receive this kind of an email, you know, hey, Rosie, this is your teacher. 
please see the link below for your exam grade. Congratulations, Mr. Donovan. And a link is provided. So Rossi decides that she's going to go check on that link because she wants to see her exam grade. And she finds that it's actually malware. <laughs> so what did we miss in this process? Well, maybe we should have looked at the from, right, and seen that it was this strange Russian uh, email and not actually Mr. Donovan. Or potentially, we could have looked at the link and seen that it was sending us to some strange IP address. But some things are going on that are relatively consistent in the human, in the human brain and with respect to human behavior that cause us to click on these kinds of links uh, to exhibit this behavior when we're looking at email. Um, and we, we, we just spoke about this previously when we're talking about sending people to, to COVID-19 websites or being able to get things like, uh, like masks on time. So the first is inattentional blindness. Inattentional blindness happens when we're paying attention to something, but we're not paying attention to the right thing. So Rossi was interested in paying attention to her email. She was paying attention to the text. She wanted to get that, that grade. And so she clicked on the link without actually looking first at the things that might have been quite important to determining whether or not it was a phishing attack, such as the from line or potentially looking at that, that, that hyperlink more, more specifically. But another thing is also potentially happening in these instances. And again, it relates back to our concerns around COVID-19 something called effective decision making, which is really our ability to make decisions out of emotion, that we may downplay the potential costs of an action simply because it may provide an emotional reward for us. In the context of Rossi, she really just wanted to see her grades. You can imagine how that might have elicited an emotional response that would cause her to just click on a link without necessarily thinking about it. Similarly, if we're trying to get better COVID information or get masks that we don't have, we may be afraid and decide that it's worth clicking on a link without really considering what the consequences are, simply because the thing on the other side of that link is really what's going to provide us with that emotional safety. So one thing that we could think about doing within the context of an interface design is designing better tools to help inform the user about where they may not be paying enough attention. So I know that some email clients are already beginning to do these sorts of things, but as designers who are recognizing that maybe people are being inattentive to important stuff, we should be careful about how we design these interfaces to ensure that we're drawing attention to the right things and not leaving people in their attentional tunnel to ignore stuff that might be quite critical. Updates are also a really big issue. You know, one of the things that I find to be completely true is that, and if you talk to experts across the spectrum, is that you know, if you if you ask them, hey, you know, how many of you think that updates are an incredibly important piece of ensuring that your your computer interface is safe, that your operating system is going to be working properly and keep you safe from malware? I bet everyone in the room would raise their hand. Ironically, if you ask people whether or not they delayed on their last update, a lot of people would also still raise their hand despite knowing better. And I find this to be sort of an interesting thing when we talk about awareness. One, in the sense that when we think about awareness, often what we're talking about is training people with education. But even the people who know the best about these things often still exhibit the behaviors that we know to be most critically problematic when it comes to keeping ourselves safe. So again, we have to go back to asking, what is important? Is it information or is it context that we have to look at to really understand what might be going on and how we can fix this problem? Updates, I think, are really dumb, frankly, because we, we see this, this interface design over and over again. You know, you get something where someone says, like, there's a new update. Are you ready to install? And they give you this really wonderful option. It's either like now or I'm just going to procrastinate on it, right? And so you say later, and then the next day comes along, and you say later, and the day after that, it's later. And then a month later, you know, it's, it's really been a while, and you probably can put yourself into a pretty bad situation. And yet we still say later. But you know, some small decisions uh, from a design perspective can actually help to mitigate the likelihood that people are going to do this sort of thing. So for instance, we know that procrastination is a really big problem. We know that we don't necessarily want to install an update we're in the middle of a conversation with somebody or for doing work or for playing Dota or something like that, right? And so what we're going to do is we're going to say later, but the interface design is pretty bad because it doesn't ask you when. It sort of says like abstractly later tonight or maybe the next day or something like that. But the next day could be when you're already in the middle of your work day, or later at night could be when you're watching something on Netflix before you go to bed. So what are you going to do to get around this kind of a problem? The other issue is that we may be reminded about our need to update at the wrong time. Again, if it's coming when we're trying to do something else like watch Netflix, you, know, you sort of are reminded that you needed to do this, but it's not at a time where you can actually take action on the update. It's at a time when you're already preoccupied with something else. So small interface designs can actually solve for this problem in a significant way. What if instead of just saying later and receiving another update uh, request at another time, 
when you say later, you have to actually make a commitment about when you're going to do this. You as the user, much more so than an AI, is probably going to have a better sense of when you have an opportunity to be able to let your computer away for a few hours to be able to go through that update process. And so you're going to be more likely to be able to say the right put the right information into your computer and allow it to then go through the process of updating on its own. Another way of thinking about this problem is around ID this idea of updates. You know, I know that um, you know the, the the Petya attack, for instance, that happened a few years ago, uh, happened because a lot of, or was the uh, the Mirai attack? I'm sorry, the Mirai uh, bot botnet attack happened because those uh, those systems were created with security standards out of the box that were really bad. The passwords were the same across the entire set of IoT devices, and so it put everybody into a bad position because no one was asked to update that password, and all the passwords were the same. The default was bad. When we talk about you know, something like Zoom security or other types of security aspects around our interface design, asking people to go through the process of reestablishing security rules on their own is both a cognitive drain, ask them to do something that's outside of their mode of operation, and is less likely to happen simply because it's a relatively large ask to figure out how you want to optimize your security platform. Instead, if we thought about defaults as being a better way of getting people to exhibit the right behavior off the bat, people are pretty sticky when it comes to, to this thing called status quo bias, this idea that whatever it is that you are presented with is most likely going to stay for a long period of time. And you're not really going to do much with it. So when it comes to things like updates, ensuring that auto update is on from the get go out of the box might be a way of being able to deal with some of these update procrastination problems. So again, it comes down to context and it comes down to interface design. We're trying to deal with these problems in a meaningful way. So we wanted to discuss a little bit about what the differences are between older populations and younger populations. Unfortunately, there isn't a ton of information about younger populations. Most of the research that's been done in, in the security space has been on people 18 years or older. Part of that has to do with the ability to consent to data concerns and other sorts of things like that. But we can learn from the psychological research about some things that are relatively true about younger people uh, that can lead us to have a better understanding about what, as, as designers, we might need to consider as we're designing these sorts of in interfaces. And one of the things I think is important to recognize is that younger people are significantly different than older people because they're going through so many changes, you know, the hormonal stuff. And I'm sorry if this sounds like a sex ed class, but the reality is that this is quite impactful in how people make decisions and act when they, when they actually are dealing with these sorts of interface design challenges. So what are those differences between older and younger populations that we can derive from the psychological research? Often what we find is that younger people have less impulse control, they make more emotional decisions, they're more socially influenced by people around them, so password sharing is a, is a bigger problem for younger populations. They're more present biased, which means that they think more about the consequences immediately than they do necessarily about long-term consequences. So you can imagine how like the issues around social media use are quite problematic because I may make decisions for myself today that I might regret in the future, but because I'm young and I don't really think about the future, it's harder for me to really think through those consequences. And the other issue is that we're more self-focused. Something that we've found within uh, the general research around awareness campaigns is that for older people, if you express your security behavior in terms of its impact on those around you, we actually find that it's a relatively strong intervention for mitigating some of the problems that we see. But for younger people, it doesn't really matter because they don't care about other people, unfortunately. And so we do have to think about other ways that we can incentivize these behaviors meaningfully to ensure that we're, we're getting younger people to exhibit the right behaviors. So some things that I think about, and I think that we can probably try uh, from an empirical perspective, maybe test, are to say, how can we think about slowing people down at critical times? This is true for all of us, but especially true for younger people, both because they have less impulse control, but also because they make these more emotional decisions. How might we be able to reinforce no norms of conduct very early? So things around the right kinds of passwords or using things like, like password generation tools very early on so that users are not taught this behavior of you know, typing in your cat's name and your address or something like that into a password form. How might we be able to get around present bias by really highlighting future consequences when it comes to moments where those future consequences are quite meaningful but may not necessarily be salient to the user? And how can we help to, again, get around this self-focus issue by highlighting not those consequences to the broader population, but to specifically the user themselves? And so this is what I leave you with. As a behavioral scientist, we must think about the context in which people are acting, whether or not we're old or young, 
understanding that context is going to give us a much clearer understanding of what we can do from an engineering perspective, a design perspective, and even from an information provision perspective to ensure that the behaviors that we want to see exhibited will ultimately be exhibited by our end users. And if you'd like to learn more, please check out ideas42.org slash cyber. And we have a few resources on there that you can take a look at, including our uh, cyber novella, uh, 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 Deep Thought, a cybersecurity story, which I highly recommend. Thank you so much, Alex, for this excellent analysis. Um, I have to say the, the, the postponing of the update sounded very familiar. Um, and it was nice to hear that there are indeed differences in behavior between younger people and older people. Um, we will actually stay in the Western Hemisphere because our next speaker is Louise Marie Hurel. Uh, she's a researcher at Iguarapa Institute in Brazil and a PhD candidate at the London School of Economics. Uh, she really studies the intersection between internet governance and the cybersecurity community. Um, so I wanted to ask you, uh, Louise Marel, about um, really the role of younger people in uh, these policy debates of internet governance and cybersecurity policy. So how is this in Brazil and the Latin America regions? And did you notice any changes over the last few years in, uh, in this role? Thank you so much, Laura. Thank you all for being here. I think I'm really excited to kind of actually go after, you know, Alex's presentation, which was really great. Uh, can also relate to the updates over here, so makes a lot of sense. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here. And I think in order to share, you know, a little bit of my experience, I, I'd really like to bring this uh, not only to kind of the, the perspective of, of Latin America and Brazil more specifically, but also to bring it to more of the individual perspective, because I do think that, you know, the EU Cyber Forum and the Youth Forum that we have here today, it's really about also the experiences all of you have and, and what you have to share. Uh, so I really like to kind of bring it also to the individual level to see if that actually also is something that you have been facing in your own context in your own reality and i think this is something really important from uh, Alex's presentation, which is, you know, how the context really influences not only how we engage with technology, not only how we engage with um, with security measures and, and nudges, but obviously how we engage in policy and how we see our position, uh, be it as youth or young professionals in these different spaces. Um, so I'd just like to kind of raise five points uh, really briefly, uh, because I, I'm really excited to go to the discussion. Um, first, I really like to provide a context because um, Brazil is a pretty big country. Um, so I just like to give you a snapshot of what that means in terms of challenges and opportunities for empowering young people uh, to engage in internet governance debates. And uh, so in Brazil, 70% of the population is connected to the internet. And most of that connect connectivity is largely concentrated in smartphones. And within this overall kind of statistics, 89% um, of the population between nine and 17 use the internet. And this is actually lower when it comes to rural or classes E and D, um, which ranges about 70 to 75% in terms of access. 95% of the whole kind of nine to 17 uh, range access the internet through their smartphones. And, and so this, this provides kind of a brief uh, piece, uh, a small fraction of how we can understand uh, the inequalities and the different realities that permeate this huge country, a huge country like Brazil, and which we need to consider when we're thinking not only about policy engagement, but about, you know, the different realities through which this younger generation comes to the making of policy. Uh, this is the experience of the internet that these people have. And obviously it is permeated by these inequalities and it is something that is not unique to Brazil. Every country has their own kind of configuration of inequalities. But I do think that this, um, this provides us with an interesting landscape for thinking not only challenges, but opportunities for um, internet and cybersecurity policy engagement uh, from the youth. The second point that I'd like to make is that younger generations are more natively connected. Obviously, as the year progresses, we are becoming more connected. 
as I said, not all are connected, uh, but their perspectives on connectivity and security will be framing uh, the future workforce and uh, the future policy development. And just to bring you another figure, which I thought was really interesting, is that um, the 2019 report from the International uh, Information System Security Certification Consortium, the ISC2, estimates that Latin America suffers from a cybersecurity workforce gap of approximately 60,000 professionals. And that, in terms of the global scale, it's 15% of the global um, workforce skills gap. Uh, and you know, at a global level, it's 40 million professionals uh, in that case. So how can we empower younger generations uh, that are more connected, that are more technologically savvy, um, and the ones that are starting to get connected right now, to actually be ready to engage in this workforce. Uh, so, so this is another thing that I like to bring because both cybersecurity and internet governance, uh, they are extremely interdisciplinary fields. And I, I don't think there's you know, one single way of getting engaged in the poli policy discussions over there. Um, and the third point that I like to make is that we need to actually, when we're thinking about cybersecurity and internet governance policies, we need to think and reconcile the role of the youth uh, as both the subjects of policies and the agents of change in internet governance um, uh, discussions. Because I do believe that both walk together. So on the one hand, at times youth, when they are seen as the subjects of, um, of these policies, they are they're framed as they are in need of protection or parental mediation, depending on their age, if they're younger. Um, and throughout the past years, uh, organizations in Brazil, such as SaferNet, um, so, which is an NGO, they have sought to invest um, in enhancing the literacy programs across the country and even partnered um, with, with different international organizations, such as UNICEF, to promote awareness campaigns uh, on best practices on digital safety. Uh, another example uh, is the Brazilian Network Information Center, which is in charge of administering the um, country code top level domain, the .br. Uh, it is in charge of creating a portal, which is called Internet Segura, which is a safe internet. Uh, and they develop reports that are targeted not only to the youth um, and, to and to children, but also to elderly. I think that that is something to put in perspective. And I would love to hear also what Alex has to say. It seems like we lost uh, Louise Marie. <laughs> All right, let maybe give her a second and otherwise we will uh, continue. That's of course also one of the difficulties of this digitalization. Um, these things happen. Uh, but I think that uh, Louise Marie already made a couple of very good points. Uh, the first one is inter the interdisciplinary um, approach of cybersecurity. I think there's this misconception that to be able to be involved in cyber and tech, you need to know all the technicalities, which is not the case. For instance, as Alex showed, there's also a lot of psychology involved, but also politics. Um, any other points? And maybe we can also go back to that in a discussion in the second half, um, that of course, young people are not only subjects, but also agents of change. I think we have Louise Marie back. Um, Yes, at what point did you lose me? I'm sorry about that. I think my, my network just totally crashed. <laughs> I think the last we heard was about the Safer, Safer Net initiative. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Uh, so, so I was talking about SaferNet, which is a great, you know, um, they have been organizing different initiatives with international organizations to try to raise awareness on how the youth can better use these technologies. For example, they have organized one with UNICEF on safer nudes and sharing of, of, of you know, personal content, uh, which I think it's something that is really kind of echoes a lot with, with, uh, with the youth. Uh, in many other countries. Um, and one other thing that I mentioned is that uh, the Brazilian network um, 
Information Center, which is the one responsible for uh, coordinating .br, which is a country called top level domain, they have created a portal called Internet Segura Safe Internet, um, which way that they developed reports from different um, for different kind of audiences, including adolescents, youth, um, children, and elderly, which I think it's something that we should consider in our discussions about not only policy engagement, but also in terms of like education and media literacy skills. Um, so that's what I was mentioning. So I, I talked about, you know, how uh, youth are framed as subjects of policy and subjects of these campaigns, but how can we shift or perhaps integrate the perspective of having youth as agents of change? And uh, some of the programs that I would like to mention is, for example, the Youth at IGF, which is a program from, uh, promoted by ISOC, the Internet Society, which takes a group and selects a group of, of, of youth from the, all across the globe. Uh, to participate in the Internet Governance Forum. The Youth at Brazilian Internet Governance Forum, which is a local initiative, which uh, has been really incredible in just getting and creating a space where the youth can engage. And I think, you know, when you look at uh, other internet governance spaces, such as Eurodig uh, in Europe, or many other uh, youth IGFs or youth lack IGF, uh, which is the one from Latin America, you can see how youth has been mobilizing around internet governance discussions and internet governance uh, forums. Um, and I can speak from the academic perspective because that is where I come from. And as I said, I want to also kind of bring this to the individual level to hear also your experiences. But both cybersecurity and internet governance, as I said, are extremely interdisciplinary fields and there's no single pathway to engagement. So in my personal experience, for example, when I was in the university, um, I, I didn't have anyone talking about cybersecurity or internet governance. I come from an international relations background and I have I had to kind of find a way to engage in these policy discussions. Obviously in Brazil, there were a lot of opportunities and I discovered there were a lot of opportunities from the youth at IGF program, the youth at, at the National uh, Internet Governance Forum, which I opened up doors in order to connect with other people, to develop a vocabulary, to kind of understand and learn from the outside of the university, because which brings me to the, the next point, um, which is the point of, uh, of understanding, you know, on the other hand, I really cannot stress how important it is for governments to actually provide these incentives or organizations to provide these incentives in Latin America, because I've, I've lived uh, that in flesh and bone. Um, I say so because, I, as I said, I was part of the, let's say, 2015 Youth at IGF program promoted by ISOC and the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee. And one example, which I think it's an outcome, just to give you an example of this, is that together with representatives uh, in Latin America that were part of this group, we developed the Youth uh, Observatory, which at, back then was just a platform for, youth, for discussing youth-related issues and bringing those perspectives to international forum and regional forum and was very much focused on Latin America. But what happened is throughout the past years, uh, it has grown exponentially and it's now a global platform for different youths uh, in different countries to engage. So one last thing that I'd like to say is, is really um, at, at now in my kind of work hat um, at the Europe Institute, we have been working with cybersecurity policy development for the past you know, I don't know, six years at least. Um, and more recently, what we identified is not only, you know, a, a gap in terms of sectors engaging in policy that they don't know what each sector is doing, but definitely is a lack, a gap in terms of knowledge. So what we are trying to do right now is really work full on on capacity building in cybersecurity and internet governance to kind of compile all of these uh, policy documents, forums, um, sector specific documents in order to provide, you know, a knowledge 
uh, a repository of knowledge for people to actually have easy access to that, which is still very hard to kind of navigate. If you talk cybersecurity, a person coming from computer science might think X, and a person coming from international relations might, might think Y. Um, so I do think there is this effort that is not specific to uh, youth, but that definitely youth has a really important role to play in structuring knowledge and thinking critically about how these policies will unfold. And in Brazil specifically, that applies to many different contexts. So let's think, for example, about the recent uh, fake news bill that has been circulating. Uh, people need to know, and younger people that are engaged in advocacy, which are a lot of people in Brazil, uh, they are very kind of skilled in understanding the different uh, security challenges that are deriving from these policies that are being drafted sometimes by people that don't understand that. So there is a very important and immediate role that uh, the youth can take in that. But I'll just stop over here and I'll leave it uh, for us to explore more in the next steps of the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Louise Marie, for this excellent analysis and overview of trends in Latin America. Uh, you also mentioned already a couple of best practices like the youth IGF. I believe we also have a, have a couple of participants from youth IGF, so I would also really like to hear from them during the, the second half. Um, but for now, we will move on to another continent, to Africa. Um, our first speaker is Kabenga Cezanne. Uh, Gabenga is executive director of Paradigm Initiative in Nigeria. So I would really like to hear from you, Gabenga, uh, how younger generations in Nigeria and the region there uh, see these cybersecurity challenges and how do they view their responses from the government over there? So over to you. Thank you, Laura, uh, and thank you, everyone. Um, so I, I, I will start um, with the reality of the times we live in. Uh, you know, I, I joined this call early, so just to be sure that, uh, you know, my internet was was okay. And then, because, uh, you know, we've had moments where, you know, you're in a call and then you're thinking that other people are not, you know, you're thinking someone else is frozen, right? But you're the one who is frozen because your internet is the one uh, that isn't working. I, I, and that's, that's the reality of the time we live in. Many of us on this call today have probably been on something between three and six different calls, uh, hopefully not as much, um, you know, and, and this, this is very different from what it was even one year ago. So one year ago, the, you know, when there wasn't COVID-19, we had the option of either traveling to meetings or meeting people, you know, in person, but now you don't, re you really don't have a choice. Uh, you have, I mean, every physical meeting that I typically speak in every year uh, has now been converted into a webinar. Uh, so, we, you know, digital is now our lived experience. And I think that forms a very strong foundation for why this conversation is important. When we could afford to do things physically, uh, not so many people paid attention, uh, you know, to cyber because it was sort of seen as an elite thing, uh, you know, many years ago, not just in Nigeria. I mean, we, we've got offices across six countries on the continent uh, in Africa. And if we went, you know, into any country and we had to do training, uh, many young people would consider uh, you know, the conversations around how to use, I mean, how to get immediate opportunities to get a job, that's fine. I mean, how do I get a job using digital? That's fine. But when you begin to talk about cybersecurity, you know, then you begin to lose people because they're thinking it can't happen to me. Uh, you know, you know, the joke is that you're, you used to be six degrees away from you know, someone who has been a victim of, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, cybersecurity glitch or something like that, but it's no longer six degrees. It's now one degree. In fact, it may be zero degree uh, because as we heard earlier from Alex, uh, we're almost all very guilty uh, of not updating. Something else we're also not, you know, very, uh, we're very guilty of is uh, in the days when we used to back up, now you don't have to back up. You know, everything is in the cloud. Uh, but I'm sure some people will remember when you had to back up, uh, you tell yourself, okay, I'll back up at the end of a month, I'll back up next week, and then your computer crashes. Um, you know, my computer crashed once with an entire book on it you know, on it, and no one taught me, you know, to, to back up, you know, from then. So the, the times we live in, the kind of experiences we have right now, we're learning online, you know, I've got two kids, five and two, and now the entire educational experience for them 
is virtual. And because of that, we'll pay more attention to details uh, you know, in terms of things around cybersecurity. So I think that if I were to state a very first point here, it would be that we're not where we used to be one year ago uh, because we have now literally been forced uh, into, this converse, into this reality of protecting our cyberspace, uh, which many people didn't really care about before because it was an option. It was a second option. It was an alternative. But guess what? It's now reality. Um, you know, so we have to pay a lot of attention to it. Uh, people who, you know, will join Zoom calls and share, you know, links and things like that. Now we know about Zoom bombing. Nobody does that anymore. I mean, now we have waiting rooms so that, you know, you can check who's, uh, who is there. Now, my, my second point is what I think has been a major opportunity over the last, uh, and I'm looking particularly over the last seven years, um, you know, of some of the young people we've worked with uh, across uh, various countries uh, and specifically looking at Nigeria, is that many young people have now identified career opportunities in cybersecurity. And I think it's a mix of many things. Uh, it's a mix of the fact that people are now interested in cyber as a subject, and also because, let's be honest, uh, there are not too many jobs to go around. Uh, and, and the fact that we have a sort of not so steep learning curve for tech, uh, you can't decide today that you want to be a doctor tomorrow, right? Uh, you can't decide today you want to be an architect, uh, but you can decide today that you want to start on the path of programming uh, in the next one week you can write hello world in one language. Of course, it's just hello world you're going to write, uh, but at least you can set yourself on that path. So I think uh, there's been that unique opportunity and, and it demonstrates the fact that there is a lot of room for technical expertise. And I'll you know, share an example uh, from, from Nigeria and Kenya uh, in particular here. Uh, so there were two different times that I had the opportunity of discussing uh, you know, with people in, finan in financial services uh, in, in the two different countries. And one of the common index uh, in both countries was the fact that banks always, and I'm sure this is true for many other countries, banks always understate their financial loss due to cybersecurity glitches. And the reason for that is because if they state exactly what is going on, uh, when they've been attacked, when they've been susceptible, nobody's going to be banking with them. It will erode trust, right? So they kind of understate it. Uh, they write it off as losses and things like that. Uh, and in that conversation, one of the big things that occurred to me is that, you know, penetration testing and many of the other technical entities, uh, you know, that have now become opportunities in many of the countries are actually unique you know, opportunities for young people. So it is not, and, and I'm going to talk about policy because I know, you know, you know, policy is, is, is my thing, but I think that uh, there's also this unique opportunity, you know, that we have. Um, the, the second opportunity I think we have is in terms of research. Uh, you know, so over the last, you know, five years, Paradigm Initiative has been producing what we call the Digital Rights in Africa report, uh, covering anything between eight and 13 uh, countries across the uh, continent. Uh, and this year, uh, we actually, uh, ex you know, expanded the number a bit. Um, and the reason for that is because we're doing not just in digital rights, but also digital inclusion. Uh, we're looking at all of the conversations around COVID-19, contact tracing apps, uh, how people have been able to experience digital in a new way, and how people have suddenly realized that what you didn't password protect before uh, is now something that you literally, uh, not just password protect, but use a password in your local language that is very difficult for anyone uh, to think uh, about. Uh, but, but the challenge we've seen over the last five years is the fact that majority of the research products we have out there about many of the countries across the continent lack, you know, their, their context light. Uh, and by that, I mean that there are many researchers uh, from various regions of the world who are very interested in cybersecurity in Africa, but nobody can do research on cybersecurity in Africa like an African young person who lives this as a daily experience. It's their lived experience. It's not an academic exercise. It's not a commercial exercise. It's a lived experience. And I think that this is a unique opportunity because this is how I got into my own career, by the way. Um, Many moons ago, many years ago, uh, about 17 years ago, uh, there was some interest in, 
in you know uh, digital divide around uh, different countries, and everybody who was talking about digital divide was talking about it from acad in the academic perspective. Oh, one billion people need to get connected and all that. But for me, it was my reality. Uh, and so when I got on the stage and shared my expertise, you know, my examples, people were looking like, oh, wow, this guy must be smart. Trust me, he didn't come up from a degree. He wasn't from a PhD or a master's. It was my lived experience. I know, I mean, I knew at the time what it meant not to have a computer, but to borrow computers from my friends when they went to watch football. And I calculated it, right? They will watch 45 minutes, first half, 30 minute break, um, 45 minutes, second half, and then two hours to argue about Man U and Chelsea and who's winning. And there I had my four hours to use a computer. So it was my lived experience. And I think that, you know, it's important for us to take advantage of this opportunity. Uh, by the way, I'll share the link for, uh, for the King Call uh, for Digital Rights and Inclusion Research uh, for 2020. It closes on Friday. Uh, today is, no, it's not Friday, it closes on Saturday. Uh, time is also something that is now a, an interesting construct. Um, I posted a tweet yesterday about let the weekend begin because yesterday honestly felt to me like Friday. Uh, and it may have to do with age, maybe. Uh, and, and you know, let me let me let me bring this to, to a close and highlight one other major opportunity. Uh, in, in across Africa's 55 countries, uh, for example, one of the things that I've seen you know, over the last few years that I'm excited about is that many African countries, including sub-regional and regional institutions, are now beginning to talk about cybersecurity. Uh, so we now have a you know, in, in 2014, sometime around June 2014, uh, the African Union came up with the Convention on Cybersecurity and Personal uh, Data Protection. Uh, it, it's been six years, but in those six years, only 14 countries have signed. Uh, it means basically, you know, uh, one, one or four or four countries have, have signed this. And the reason why, you know, they signed this is because of pressure uh, from citizens, because a lot of people are talking about this, and also because of political will. But we know that one has an impact on the other. If a lot more young people talk about these issues, if a lot more young people push this, you know, as an agenda, then it may become something that, you know, uh, becomes a political advantage for someone who then works on policy around it. Um, even though only a quarter of countries have make, you know, made progress uh, with this, it would interest you that only one out of seven, only eight countries have ratified uh, and deposited. And, you know, I, I, of course, you know, typical, uh, the usual suspects like Ghana, you know, uh, Guinea, Mozambique, Mauritius, Namibia, Rwanda, no surprise, Senegal and Angola. Uh, but what will interest you is that there has been no action whatsoever on this convention by the biggest economies on the continent, the big six, Nigeria, South Africa, Egypt, Algeria, Morocco, and Kenya. And I think that this presents a unique opportunity uh, for young people in these countries. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's an easy case to make. If you're the biggest economy, and you're not paying as much attention uh, to cybersecurity, then what you're basically doing is you're setting yourself up you know, for, you know, for attacks and you, know, you become susceptible. I mean, there is no surprise that when it comes to cases around cybersecurity breaches, and when you talk about cybercrime, Nigeria is one of the countries that is mentioned. I mean, the reason is very obvious, because if you're the biggest economy on the continent and one of the countries that does not talk about the subject of cybersecurity, at a regional level, and I'm not saying just the individual country level, uh, you know, conversation now, but at a regional level, that it obviously shows uh, where your priorities are. Finally, the need for youth interest in policy conversations cannot be overstated. And, and I say this as a 43 year old who has uh, seen what can happen when at 15 or 16, you start paying attention uh, to a subject. Uh, I was a curious 17, 18 year old uh, who joined the process of thinking a lot about technology and the future of Africa. Uh, and I've now become a 43 year old expert. And I think that the, the gap between curiosity and expertise is something that young people can easily feel. You know, if I start today uh, as a curious person to to become an expert, uh, you know, I'll probably get a lot more gray hair before, uh, before I can think of, you know, even understanding a bit more. But as a young person, you have a unique opportunity. You can pay attention to the subject matter right now so that when you invest, you know, they talk about, the, you know, 
the 10,000 hour principle, which on the average comes to about four hours of dedicated time. Uh, if you look at the school calendar, so if you spend four hours focused on a subject, not only do you become an expert in it, it also presents to you uh, an economic opportunity. Uh, many of you may not have heard, uh, many of you may have read uh, or maybe know about uh, what was the World Summit on Information Society uh, in 2003. Uh, in 2003, I was part of what was called the Youth Caucus. Uh, it was just a group of uh, curious young people from different countries who came together and just wanted to force their way uh, into the information society conversations. Uh, and then we took it down to the country level and started what we called RENIX, which was the Regional Youth uh, Nigeria Information Campaign uh, for the Information Society. And that, by the way, was what led the foundation many, many years later that then became what is today Paradigm Initiative, uh, where we have opportunities for young people to learn. And so, you know, through fellowships and, and workshops. So I think that we have a major opportunity for young people. The issues are there. Right now we're living uh, in the reality of the need to talk a lot more about cybersecurity because this is when digital is not an option, uh, but a reality. Uh, and now that I have a polite note saying I should shut up, uh, I will do exactly that. Thank you. I'm, I'm more than happy to take questions later. Many thanks, Kabenga, for laying out the trends in, uh, in Africa and the region. And it's also very good that you highlighted the opportunity, so the positive side of this all. So it's never too, learn, never too late to learn about tech. And that being said, um, let us go back to Europe, to our last speaker, last but not least, uh, Sonja Fischbauer. Uh, Sonja is program lead for Jugendhakt at the Open Knowledge Foundation in Germany. And Sonia, you have this really innovative uh, approach, you can hack that focuses on ethical hacking. So how can we use such projects to raise cybersecurity awareness among younger generations? Hi, Laura. Thanks for, the, uh, thanks for handing me the stage. And hello, everyone in the chat and here on, uh, in this session. Yeah, we are a nonprofit organization based in Berlin. And uh, we fight for open knowledge and democratic participation of civil society. And the program that I represent today, Laura has already announced it, is called Jugendhakt, which is German and translates to youth hacks. And why hacking is a good and creative skill to practice, one which furthers awareness for security, that is something that I will be talking about briefly here until we go, uh, before we go into this very interesting discussion. So Jugendhakt is a program for young people who are interested in, who are curious for, yeah, honing that curiosity that Gebenga uh, mentioned, uh, who are curious for uh, technology and also want to improve the world with their skills. We host hackathons and workshops and community talks in other formats, both in person and online. Our participants are between 12 and 18 years old, and supported by volunteer mentors, they can team up at our events and workshops and develop digital tools and prototypes and ideas for a better future. To give you like some concrete examples of what, what our participants come up with in the short time that they have at a three-day hackathon or like a one-day workshop, um, we have, for example, something called a tree file, which is a prototype for a bike that when you pedal it, that not only it, it does water a tree, so that the pedaling provide, uh, powers a water pump, and uh, then when the tree has enough water, it'll give off free Wi-Fi. So those are the ideas and prototypes that the young people come up with. So our aim is to, is to combine technical, technical skills and empowering people to find, like, yeah, to find their, their power and empowerment by using those technical skills and combine it with, with an agency, with giving them agency and the tools to change the world. So we encourage peer-to-peer -peer learning, which is something that's, in our opinion, super important in any topic when you work with young, with, with young people, that you have sort of like an eye-to-eye -eye approach. There was the question in the chat before uh, from Tara, I hope I'm saying that right. Um, and you were asking the question, how, how we can best provide online safety for youth 
on and offline? And how can we as a tech community engage them to become agents of change or the agents of change that they like, innately want to be as we can see with all of the movement from Gen Z and Fridays for Future and all of that and all of that passion there is already outside there and inside of the young people. So my, my response to this question, what can we do to teach them about, um, yeah, to provide online safety for them is to invite them to an eye to eye discussion, critical reflection on, yeah, on the topics that they are interested in whilst doing something that they enjoy and are already already wanting to get better at. So not a top-down approach, but actually giving them the means to change the world. And um, yeah, so we do facilitate discussions about security and most of all about ethical hacking at the beginning of all of our, well, hackathons. Hacking, that's, yeah, when we first started the program in Germany, that was in 2013, it was meant to be a little, not, not really provocative, but it, me, it was meant to be out there to call a program Youth Hacks, um, because hacking is generally, or like very often associated with, with crime and security crimes. But originally that term was used to describe someone, a, a hacker who, solves a tough problem with the creativity and skills that they have honed because of their geeky knowledge about that particular subject. In recent days, if you think of life hacks, that's also like a good example of how to frame this term in a positive way. And we believe that this, that this creativity that is, that is necessary to solve a tough problem, that that is exactly the skill that we need to we need to bank on when when we work with young people who are interested in tech and young people who we want to give the opportunity to engage more in that interest because they maybe do not have like the best um, Voraussetzungen. What is that in English? The best um, like or possibilities or opportunities to do this depending on their, their background and other stuff. So it's also really, really important to pay, to pay attention to not only providing that straight, white, male, Euro, Eurocentric image of tech and not using technology for technology's sake, but also showing you know, the, the human perspective of it. So with an, with an eye to the clock, let me give you our three, my three like main points to take away from this, our three measures to increase security awareness in young people. That would be one, to encourage participation, to provide young people with the tools to make the change to themselves and to foster peer-to-peer -peer learning. And then number two would be to talk about the human and social side of technology because technology is not neutral. It's created within human, societal, and political context, and it is a means for power. It can enforce existing inequalities and power structures, but it can also help to make things better. Which brings me to point three, um, telling a positive narrative. We believe that it's, that it's better to focus on that part where instead of warning of the dangers of the internet and telling young people to, oh my God, the internet is not safe and you must be protected, better to show the possibilities and paint a positive picture of how the world can be changed. And yeah, because we firmly do believe that young people do very much care about other people and they actually already have the curiosity to make the world a better place and more secure. Great, thank you so much, Sonia, for kind of uh, creating this uh, step list of uh, how to turn young people into agents of change. I would actually like to uh, turn back to Tara's question about this, because I think this is really an important point 
that youth basically has two different kind of this paradox. So on the one on the one hand, young people need to be protected from the dangers of internet, uh, grooming, etc. But on the other hand, they also have unique digital skills and insights. So they also need to be involved. They can really bring something to the table. So that is something I would like to hear also from the other panelists, what they think young people in particular can bring to the table and how we can raise this also more, not only among young people ourselves, but also to the policymakers. And I would also like to invite all the participants to also add their ideas in the chat. Uh, please continue to ask questions so we can get back to that later later on. I don't know if anyone else wants to, wants to answer this question first. Yukako, maybe you can say a little bit about Asia, how the role of young people is viewed also with CERT, if there are particular campaigns, for instance, to, uh, to raise cybersecurity awareness among younger people, but also to how to involve them more in a policy discussion. Um, all right, so um, I'd like to answer your question a little bit from a different perspective. So I think some of the, 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 the panelists already mentioned about the Korea perspective, and I think it's a good point uh, when you talk about the, you know, cybersecurity uh, to a younger generation. So um, the Korea perspective, so I think I would I'd like to say um, that there are many ways to um, engage with cybersecurity uh, in terms of the career. For example, um, I think, Luis Maria, you, I think you mentioned that you, you come from the international relations perspective. And um, I myself also come from like a non-technical perspective. And now I'm in the third team, like which is quite technical, but not, I'm not really doing a technical job right now. But I'm, I'm still in the um, international cooperation perspective. I'm dealing with the um, technical community. So um, to, to be able to um, join the cybersecurity community or like to, to engage with the cybersecurity community, you don't necessarily have to be a you know, tech geek or um, you don't have to be a hacker or you don't, have, you don't really have to be a programmer or anything like that. But uh, there are many actually venues to, to engage with them, um, like policy discussions, uh, internet governance, um, in my case, inter international cooperation, uh, capacity building. Um, there are many different ways um, in cybersecurity area. So I guess um, that offers a lot of opportunity for the younger generation. Um, and yeah, I think there are a lot of um, potentials um, in, in this area. And I hope that gives some hints to um, this question um, for other panelists. Laura, can can I go ahead and, and answer that question as well? Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, no, I just like to react to Tara's question. Uh, it, thank you, Tara, for that. It's a, a really important one. Um, obviously, I don't come from the technical background and um, I am studying technical uh, incident response communities. So, so, you know, I think one of the main things that, and I'd say that from, you know, a person that has been engaging in policy discussions, uh, both in Brazil and internationally, that I think the main thing is to be able and to be open uh, to exploring different types of knowledge, to understanding that policy, especially when it comes to cybersecurity, cannot be made if it's not a combination between, you know, an understanding of of the rights that are being kind of negotiated in that. Who is that policy protecting? What kinds of rights is that policy protecting while dealing with security online? Um, I think th these kinds of answers, they can only come from people with different backgrounds. And obviously another thing that I think is, is fundamental is the role of the youth in that. Um, there are different, as I said in my, in, my, in my intervention, there are different realities and different types of youth in one particular country. There are different economic kind of levels and different opportunities. Unfortunately, still there's a lot of inequality. And I think we should 
face you know policy development with that in mind because we do need to think that policies they are going to be the ones that are going to shape you know how the future generations are going to interact with these technologies and they should be able to encompass the views of people that are living and i say that from a brazilian perspective people that are living in uh, communities and favelas and people that are kind of in other kind of uh, economic ranges. So it should speak to these different realities. And I can only think about, you know, the role of the youth for me, it's very clear because they are the ones that are vocalizing that. They are the ones that are experiencing that. And I think Venga really put that perfectly, which is the lived experience and how that is a very important kind of capital to actually bring to the policy discussion and a fundamental one. Otherwise, the ones that are developing the policy, the policymakers right now, they won't be able to kind of reflect that. So I do think these channels between the youth and understanding that they are the ones that will not only be the ones using these technologies and implementing them in the future, um, but they are the ones that are kind of like experiencing them now. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to leave that comment. Yeah, thank you, uh, Louise Marie. I think you're making a very important point here that we really need people from different backgrounds, not merely just technical, to, to get involved. And that maybe also ties in with this narrative, this narrative we need to reach a wider audience I think that is something that the climate movement, for instance, does very well, this very simple narrative. We need to uh, reduce, um, of course, temperature rise. We also need to create kind of this narrative, I think, for cyber and technology to make it clear what it's about, um, to have this interdisciplinary view. So I think that is something that, uh, that we can really think about. Uh, and for now, I wanted to give the floor to Alex, if you could maybe react to all the things that have been, have been posed before. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think that, you know, one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about is how we actually move into a policy space where we're going to be comfortable creating legislation around both how things are designed, how things are developed, and how we expect um, service providers to actually interact with the populace in general. Because I think that a lot of the concerns around safety are really around how are we providing tools, product to individuals, and how are those individuals then using those products and tools? Um, I think that part of what needs to be brought in is this empirical science, which is saying that, you know, we know that there are these generally true things about people. We know that we can design interfaces or, des or design even like development processes to ensure that systems are safer, that those interfaces are safer. Um, but at the same time, you know, my concern is that if we take a perspective like thinking about dark patterns and say that all dark patterns are evil and we should, we should create a rule that says we can't have them with an interface design, that we may not have enough flexibility to accommodate um, how various types of interface design may actually be beneficial for subpopulations. So it really just goes back to this broader point, which is that we do need an inclusive conversation about um, both what we deem is true through empiricism, but also what our ends are going to be. Um, otherwise, we're going to leave people out in ways that are going to be quite detrimental to the outcomes that I think we're trying to achieve. Um, but I do think that, you know, we are faced with this really big reality where the internet, the way that we've used computers historically has been effectively a wild west in a lot of respects. And the challenges that we're facing now do come very much down to um, tensions between freedom, freedom of expression, uh, the ability to share information in meaningful ways, um, but also needing to protect people in ways that might be quite contrary to those principles. And wrestling with that is something that I think, you know, we're going to have a very difficult time doing, but again, requires a significant amount of, of information sharing amongst people who might come from very disparate perspectives. Otherwise, it's not going to suit the needs of the global population, which I think is the, the, the larger goal. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for this, uh, Alex. Um, I also saw that we have two questions in the chat, so I would like to turn to those. Um, our Purva asked, um, while the panel addresses youth as uh, agents of change and as victims, the majority of perpetrators of cybercrime are also youth. Could anyone shed light on how they can be brought into the mainstream cybersecurity and how to use their skills for uh, better purposes? Is there anyone who would like on the panel who would like to react to this? Sure. Um... I'd like to give it a go. Um, a, a big part of what I, you know, my work in policy is built on an experience very much related to this. Uh, so when I started out, I was training young people and, and, and 
you know, one of those times when I was literally boasting about how great these young people who literally had no future had now become. Uh, I mentioned at a public event that, you know, some of them were involved in cybercrime, but they are now using uh, those skills positively. Uh, and as soon as I left the stage, uh, one of the government agency representatives came to me and said, Oh, by the way, can I have the contact details of those former cyber criminals so that we can go and arrest them? Uh, you know, I, and I was shocked, like, why would you? Because they no longer do that. Uh, and we made a joke about it to say that uh, this may actually be an opportunity because reality is what we saw uh, from our training and the experience experience of young people now focusing on using those skills positively is that if you could actually do those things in ways that you may have to look over your shoulders, um, you could also translate those skills into something that can give you economic opportunities, it can give you social status, in, you can, it can even literally make you uh, a rock star. But I think what we have not done enough uh, is we haven't shown, and, and this is about signaling, we haven't shown a lot of young people who think it's cool to do the wrong thing, how cool it is to do the right thing. So when something, someone does something wrong, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's a uh, cybersecurity incident involving a young person. There are a lot of stories about this young person and we create a court status around this person for doing the wrong thing. Uh, we don't have the equivalent of that uh, when a young person does something uh, using those same skills positively, uh, saving a city or bank and all that uh, from, you know, from attack and things like that. That's, that's one element uh, that we have seen in our work, but is very useful. I mean, of course, we even had a phrase for you, positive peer pressure. Uh, peer pressure is a natural thing uh, that not even just young people are susceptible to, uh, but it, there's, there's a way around making it positive uh, such that people who would typically want to use the skills in the wrong way now know there are opportunities for them to use it the right way and they get rewarded for that. Thank you. Thank you for that, Kabenga. I also saw that we had another question in the chat from Nishan about another important uh, topic, disinformation. Um, he writes that disinformation spread through social media, um, and this is kind of an important issue, quite rampant in these testing times, which has consequently compromised our safety in various ways and is adversely affecting democracy and discourse. Um, children and a lot of adults who don't have media literacy are highly susceptible. Uh, and then, of course, there's also the psychology behind this uh, and compromised policies. So he asked, is there a way for platform owners to control and monitor this without affecting factors like freedom of speech and to make a proper change? So what can young people do to improve this? Um, does anyone want to respond, respond to this? I think Louise I might, be, might be a question for you or, or Alex, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so I was just responding that, you know, I think, I think what a lot of this really does come down to is the establishment of social norms. Uh, you could imagine that, you know, really a lot of this is, is self-policing amongst a population of individuals that see themselves as peers. Um, but moving that forward in a meaningful way and scaling that is quite difficult. And I was relating this back to what's happening in the United States right now around the Black Lives Matters movement and our perspectives on systemic racism. Um, if we wanna prevent you know, youth bullying online or other sorts of you know, disinformation use, um, we have to be able to both promote injunctive norms uh, amongst that population. And I think that young people are in a very strong position to be able to disseminate those things. But I think that the broader goal, what we really wanna to get to, and maybe this speaks to the IR folk out there, is that we want to get to um, you know descriptive norms that actually speak to what's happening in the environment. You know things I mean, we we can talk about like the, the treaty theory in some sense and how we're able to get to that place in the globalized economy. But at the same time, like we need something like that within our own uh, general way of of going about our lives online and and with respect to each other. Um, but it really does come down to all of us in some sense agreeing that we want to abide by the same set of values. Um, I'm not sure the best process for getting there but it really does involve a lot of people advocating for what they think is right, speaking up um, and telling other people who they think are doing the wrong thing that they are doing the wrong thing. Um, but that, that requires a significant amount of discomfort, I think, of a lot of people. So I, it's unclear kind of what the right, right modality there is, but I think that we should be supporting people and doing the uncomfortable thing as much as possible. 
Yeah, thank you, Alex. I think this idea of norms and values also very much ties in with the work that Sonia is doing. So it's also a lot about training, training younger people. So I was wondering, Sonia, if you would like to get back to this point as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, actually, yeah, we do. We do have we do have this topic of like fake news and misinformation and how to like how to come by that or how to counteract that and there are um well there are concrete measures that we or like a, a, like a concrete approach that we take in our program but before i come to that i would also sort of like out of my own perspective state the point that like what like with the news bubbles and what news you are presented with that is also a question of algorithms which are set in place by companies or also policies behind those companies so it is not only like on the young people who are probably not even ready to vote yet to change those policies so that there is like from a broader perspective and like more yeah from a more higher up uh like approach yeah but yeah what we can do to uh, approach this problem like hands-on in our programs in our hackathons is that uh, we encourage the um, young people or sometimes they just come up with the things by themselves to play around with projects that um, maybe generate fake news or to like play around with these ideas and and uh, some algorithms and create like biased algorithms to sort of like suss out what what the details of those are and as i mentioned before like to become a really good and positive hacker you have to sort of like know the subject and when you build like a biased algorithm yourself or like some fake news based project yourself then you will be more able to identify it and call it out and do the right thing <laughs> great sign that's a great way to end do the right thing sure. um we're slowly nearing the end of the, the forum. So that is why I wanted to turn over to Mara. Uh, Mara has been visualizing this session. So I was wondering if we could share what she has been working on. Would it be possible to share your screen, Mara? I'm not sure if she is still um, still on the line. So let's, let's why not first turn to some other questions because we got a lot of questions uh, rolling in. Um, we got one for from Saraj for Yukako. So uh, specifically about Japan. So how is Japan dealing with the lack of cybersecurity skill set? How can a CERT give guideline principles for recruiting young cybersecurity professionals for developing countries in Asia? Um, maybe let's, if you could answer this question very quickly, Yukako, in a sentence, then afterwards we can, uh, we can turn to Mara's, uh, Mara's overview. Um, sure. So yeah, as, as search perspective, so yes, we do, we, well, the developing the human, human resources may not be our, um, you know, the best priority. Um, but uh, other government agencies are actually working on that. So, for example, in Japan, a um, couple of years ago, there was a um, center for um, center of excellence um, established uh, for uh, industrial cybersecurity, etc. So there, like, they have like really ex extensive training uh, for cybersecurity and especially on industrial cybersecurity. That was a new approach. And uh, th yes, there are there are many other uh, government um, projects and also industry um, group approach um, to um, develop human human resources um, in in Japan. That's my short answer to the question. Great, thank you. And I was wondering if we could, uh, Mara, if it would be possible to show um, your visuals. Currently, we can spotlight uh, Mara's uh, video. I don't know how to do that. Ah, there it is. <laughs> there we go. So this is kind of a, a visualization of what we have been uh, have been discussing over the last one and a half hour. Um, so we see. Oh, my screen is not so sharp. 
But, um, oh, there it goes. We see a lot of different aspects. Um, so from COVID-19, phishing, VPN, we see uh, awareness, behavior science, context, design. Uh, interdisciplinary was a very big topic that we discussed, but also how to attract youth to cyber. Um, uh, a lot of room for technical expertise was also a very important point that Gabenga highlighted. And then, uh, of course, also uh, Jugend, Jugend Hakt is an example of how to give youth tools uh, to be involved. And of course, one big item was also young people as agents for change. Um, to get back to the discussion, to kind of wrap it up, I would like to give uh, Louise Marie the floor. Uh, I think you had a last question you wanted to raise. Uh, no, actually, the other speakers already kind of raised the points that I was going to mention. I was just going to comment on the disinformation, kind of what can you do, but they already raised it, so that's fine. Okay, fantastic. Then I had one last question before we, before we wrap it up. I was wondering if uh, everyone who is participating could write in a chat what they think will be the most important issue in cyber for uh, young people the coming two to three years. So if you could just write your answer in the chat and I would like to ask the panelists if they could say it in one, one sentence what they think will be the most important issue in cyber for young people. So I don't know who wants to kick kick off. Alex, can I give you the floor? Yeah, I think that moving forward, the thing that's going to be most important for young people to be considering is how we think about regulating the internet in the future. Um, I think we're beginning to recognize that our sort of Wild West approach is not working the way that we want it to for a number of reasons. Um, and creating the right kind of regulation is gonna be an incredibly challenging task. Um, but one that I think that youth are probably in a good position to take on. Good point. Um, Louise Marie, what do you think? I would say it's something something along those lines, but definitely I would uh, I would definitely reinforce the aspect of developing trust in developing policies um, related to um, cybersecurity and ensuring that. Um, and ensuring that all stakeholders are participating in that process. Great. I saw that Yukako already wrote international collaboration. Um, would you like to elaborate that? Yeah, so um, I would say that uh, um, when it comes to incidents or any, any kinds of um, um, co collaboration, um, one single nation cannot do everything. So in that sense, um, you know, we all need help and assistance from other countries, especially that those are um, neighbor to you. So international collaboration is always the key, I think. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. And Sonia, over to you. I would say that moving forward, we should bank on open knowledge, open data, like open source and focus on the importance of civic tech as a means for I want to participate on an equal level. Great. And last but not least, Kabanga, what do you think is going to be the most important issue? I think enlightened self-interest. Uh, I say that because as young people, it's your future. Uh, most of the people who are you know, drafting the policies today will not be here to experience the weaknesses of their drafts. It's your future. Uh, get your self-interest through the door. It's enlightened. Don't worry. Don't feel guilty about it. Protect your future, protect yourself, and that way you protect us. Thank you. Great. It's also good to see that we got a lot of responses on the chat. Um, a lot of people say protection of personal data, staying in touch with people of your region, um, awareness to threats, sharing of information, uh, digital literacy, uh, information consumption and sharing data online. So I think in the coming years, we got a lot of, lot of things to do. Uh, and on this note, I would like to conclude the Youth Cyber Forum. I would like to send a huge thank you to all the input speakers for the excellent contribution. Also a huge thank you to all the participants. It was great to see that there was interaction in the chat, that people were sharing their thoughts, their questions. Um, and I would also like to thank the partners of EU Cyber Forum and my own uh, EU Cyber Direct team. 
Um, we got a lot of contributions, inputs, ideas, so I hope that we can continue the discussion uh, in the future. But for now, thank you very much and have a, have a good day. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Stay safe. Everybody. Bye. Bye. -bye.